Throughout recorded history, mankind has dreamt of building the perfect society, an empire that might somehow satisfy the needs of every man. An ancient legend cast the shadows of one such society that is said to have existed long ago. 2,500 years ago, the Greek philosopher Plato set down a dialogue called the Critias. He recounted the story of an ancient Greek poet and statesman named Solon. Solon had journeyed to Egypt in search of wisdom to help the government of his beloved Greece. The Greeks had been beset with factions and troubles, so Solon took counsel from the priests of the city of Sais. An old priest told him, O oh, Solon, Solon, you Greeks are never anything but children. There is no old opinion handed down among you, nor any science that is white with age. The old priest then proceeded to tell him the story of the lost city of Atlantis. In the centuries that would follow, scholars and researchers have debated whether Plato's Atlantis was intended to be an account of real history or simply an allegorical myth. Some even suggest that Atlantis was really the antediluvian world, the wicked society destroyed by the wrath of God in the great flood of Noah. In the 20th century, Plato's account was further supported by Masonic philosopher Manly P. Hall. Hall claimed that Atlantis had once been a vast and mighty empire that extended to the whole world, a philosophic commonwealth of nations that one day was destined to be rebuilt. But who would rebuild it? And exactly who was Manly P. Hall? Manly P. Hall was probably the most highly esteemed occultist and Freemason of the 20th century. Uh, he uh, understood the secrets of the ages long before he ever joined the Mason. was really the foremost authority on the occultist side of Freemasonry, the deep, dark uh, side of Freemasonry, the one that most Masons never ascend to. I can't really think of anybody close to him. Manny P. Hall was the, one of the leading uh, people within this whole other world that we talk about. Hall authored over 200 books and is said to have given some 8,000 lectures on ancient philosophy. He is perhaps most remembered for his contribution to the mysterious brotherhood of masonry. Upon his death in 1990, the Scottish Rite Journal, a Masonic publication, noted that he was often called, quote, masonry's greatest philosopher. Among his teachings was that contained in masonry and all the secret orders was the ancient wisdom of lost Atlantis. Hall wrote that for more than 3,000 years, secret societies had been laboring to create a background of knowledge necessary to the establishment of an enlightened democracy among the nations of the world. According to Hall, these societies could be traced back to ancient Egypt and had for centuries known of a secret place hidden from the eyes of common men, a place that would one day be revealed. In the 17th century, as settlers were colonizing the New World, Sir Francis Bacon, the leader of secret societies in England, set down his classic work, The New Atlantis. While archaeologists and treasure hunters have searched the globe looking for the lost continent, 400 years ago, Bacon, like many of his contemporaries, believed that Atlantis was America itself. Well, Bacon, to me, was really uh, fundamental uh, in, in the American colonizational scheme and its connection to the, the new Atlantis concept. He was trying to lay a foundation for uh, what could be accomplished uh, in the new world. While the Atlantis of Plato was a mighty empire known for the philosophy of its kings, Bacon would write of a nation governed by scientific achievement, filled with marvels and wonders never before seen. Bacon was talking about this new nation, talking about submarines, talking about 
unimaginable weapons of war, talking about flying machines and tall buildings. I mean, how did he come into possession of this knowledge? Did Francis Bacon outline the course of the new world before its time? And if so, by what power was he inspired to do so? While there are no states or cities that bear his name, his mysterious influence has compelled some to call him the real and true founder of America. His founding of America was really through other people who were following his work, following his, the program he'd laid out. Bacon was the head of Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism. He had a huge influence through being the chief of the Rosicrucian fraternity at the time. He had a huge influence on the birth of modern Freemasonry. And many of those Rosicrucians actually went into Freemasonry at that time to lift it up to its, its new level. And Freemasonry has a major influence on the founding of America. While many of the early settlers came to work the land for the cause of religious freedom, there were with them secret societies who came to the New World with another agenda. Secret societies came to America shortly after the pilgrims arrived, and they were sent by a man named Sir Francis Bacon. You get this, this very strange mixture of people, many of whom understood even then the advantage, spiritually and otherwise, to having secret orders. Unless you understand the influence of the occult societies uh, on the development of America, on the establishment of America, upon the course of America, why you get completely lost studying our history. And they were the ones through which this work was being put into operation in England, in Europe, and eventually in America and the world. So that America then could be used to lead the world uh, into the philosophic empire. You understand that America was founded by Christians as a Christian nation. However, there were always those people on the other side who wanted to use America, use our military power and our financial power to establish uh, enlightened democracies throughout the world and restore lost Atlantis. Yeah, maybe Bacon had it right. Maybe uh, Atlantis is not something yet to occur, but maybe it's occurring right now in America. In his lifetime, Sir Francis Bacon referred to himself as the herald of a new age. He promoted a new universal order for the whole world. Can this be what early American founders referred to with the words Novus Ordo Seclorum, the new order of the ages? And does this vision affect America today? When our founders declared a new order of the ages, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. As America marches forward, spreading democracy throughout the globe, is she merely promoting freedom or fulfilling an ancient plan? Is she following a course planned for centuries by men who believe she is chosen for a secret destiny?